So thank you uh, to the organizers for uh, letting me participate in this great uh, workshop. Um, so uh, a big theme in, uh, in ultra-cold atoms uh, is, is dynamics. And uh, the reason for that is that, um, well, firstly, they're, they're typically dilute gases. So the dynamics tends to be slow, so you can watch it in action. Uh, that's in contrast to typical condensed matter systems where the dynamics tends to be very quick. And another thing is you can isolate them very well from the environment. They're ultra-cold, so you tend to get coherent dynamics that goes and goes for a very long time, so you get a, a, a real chance to see the dynamics run. And so given if, if one is interested in, uh, in dynamics, uh, what is the most interesting part of the dynamics, or is there anything, say, universal about dynamics? And that's, that's what I'm really interested in, uh, as universal aspects of dynamics. So one universal aspect of dynamics are singularities. So it turns out that close to singularities, um, well, as, as we'll see, what, what catastrophe theory tells you is that you can only have certain types of singularities. And it's, it's so it's the, in a way, the singularity is your friend, and very in the neighborhood of the singularity, everything behaves in a very uh, universal and, and predictable way. So in fact, uh, if I don't make it to the end of my talk or you fall asleep, this is probably the summary of, of the talk up there. So you'll see three different pictures of kind of the same phenomena. Who, who actually has, has seen this in their coffee cup before? No one? 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 Two? Are you scientists? Observer? Okay. So this is uh, an example of a, of a caustic. And what you can see here is that it's, uh, well, we can describe this with, with the geometric theory. You don't see any wave oscillations on it. If you zoom in a bit more, um, the black line is, is, is the geometric caustic, but you get interference patterns. If uh, this, this is a phenomenon of light, so the light is propagating from, let's say, above and is bouncing off the back wall of the, the mug and is forming this kind of focus, except it's not a perfect focus. If it was a perfect focus, it would be a spot. If the back wall was a parabolic mirror, it would focus a spot. But the point is that uh, these... These catastrophes are, are generic things. If you break the symmetry away from being a perfect, a perfect uh, parabola, that, that focus point is unstable and it explodes into this cuspy structure. And if we go one, so we get waves, and if we go one, uh, one further and we ask, well, in, in the quantum world, if you have a quantum field, uh, then you can look for these things in, in Fox space, actually, and then you find that they're discretized, and these are the, the quanta of the, of the excitations. We'll, we'll, so we'll come to all of this. Uh, oh, so uh, before I get started, um, uh, so Ryan, where are you, Ryan? Hope you're here. There he is. So he has a poster on, on this, and it's kind of in the, on the back wall there. It's kind of over there. Okay, so I'm going to give you a quick run-through about catastrophe theory, and then we're going to apply it to the dynamics of what I've learned here is the model one of the models of the Hamiltonian mean field model, with, but applied to cold atoms. And then we'll also see uh, catastrophes in, um, in the transverse field Ising model. So here's a sort of uh, zoo of, uh, of, of catastrophes. Uh, so this, this simple one, this coffee cup caustic, but also the bright lines on the bottom of a swimming pool. This is focusing of, of sunlight by the waves on the surface. A rainbow, that's a focusing in, in, in angle space the, the, by water droplets. Of course, they're not perfect lenses. So again, you don't get a perfect focus. Uh, gravitational lensing is another example in nature. In fact, there's five different images of the same galaxy. If you line up A with A and B with B, I can't really see them from here, but maybe you can. Then you get five different images of the same galaxy, which is behind some mass distribution and it gets refocused in various ways. Uh, and there's various other examples like rogue waves at sea and, and ship waves and so on. Um, and then there's other fancier things like Hawking radiation. Um, we saw yesterday about the Anderson transition. So it turns out that the wave packet shapes at the Anderson transition are, uh, are catastrophes, in fact. So once you have the eyes to see these things, you, in fact, see them everywhere. So here's the, here's the geometric picture. Actually, Leonardo da Vinci, since we're in Italy, he, uh, he had to go and understand this. And I guess Italians like coffee, so maybe stir it into your coffee cup. 
Um, so that we imagine the, these, these light rays, are just half of them are shown here, are coming, and then they bounce off the back, the back wall of the, of, the, of the coffee cup. And then the, the caustic is the envelope. And the point is that these are structurally stable, so we've already perturbed away from being a perfect parabola, say, which would give a focus point. But now imagine this cup was plastic. If I pressed into it, this structure would be shifted and stretched and so on, but it, it fundamentally wouldn't change its shape. It would be sheared and all sorts of things, but it would still have that fundamental shape. So in that sense, they're, they're structurally stable and uh, hence generic. And the other thing is that within the, the geometric theory of optics, then, if you work out the intensity along this caustic line, you'll find out that it's infinite. So that's interesting, because that's a, it's a place where one theory breaks down, and you have to go to a better theory. Of course, we know what the better theory is for light. It's, it's waves. Uh, more pertinent to the subject of this conference, as I said, when you look for these things, you see them everywhere. So some years ago, uh, there was this conference, which I was at, and I had a chapter on a completely different subject in this book. And I was looking at the book when it arrived in the post some years after the conference, and, I, and the front cover intrigued me. And so these are, in fact, uh, uh, examples from the, the Hamiltonian mean field model. So the, what one example you can think of is particles distributed around a ring. And so the density of particles is plotted along the top here as a function of, of angle. This is uh, initial time up here. And it is, OK, if you start with them perfectly symmetrically around the ring, then the forces in each direction are equal and nothing happens. But if you perturb the, the particles slightly from their equilibrium positions and let it go, it spontaneously forms these, these, these bi-clusters. So these density spontaneously focuses, um, as we heard actually on the, on the first day in Julian's talk. Um, and so this is, this is described then by these long-range uh, cosine uh, interactions. Uh, I put in this slide. I must say I'm not, a, I, I don't, this is probably all I know about these gravity-driven uh, examples. But I don't know what happened to this theory after it came out, if anyone from the gravity community has heard of it. But the, the claim is, so Arnold was one of the inventors of catastrophe theory. But working with Zeldovich, uh, they predicted that certain structures that are going to form under, under gravitation uh, would have, that could, you start off with a smooth distribution and you will, can develop singular structures. So I'll, maybe afterwards I'd be, I'd be happy to know if anything ever came of that, that work. Uh, okay, so, so this is the, the kind of the, the, the picture behind uh, catastrophe theory. Um, so in every dimension of space, there are only certain allowed types of, of singularity. And what I mean by this, these are singularities of, uh, of gradient maps. And gradient maps include things like uh, classical mechanics and quantum mechanics. In fact, any theory that relies on a variational principle is a gradient map. And that's a very large chunk of, of physics. If, that's, if, if you have a theory relying on a, on a variational principle, then the idea is that these are the structurally stable singularities. That's not to say you can't get other singularities, but those other singularities generically will vanish if you, if you move away from some special symmetry or something like that. So on a line, in, in one dimension, the, the, the singularity can be a point. In two dimensions, it's this, it's this cusp. Um, in three dimensions, then, you have these three different classes. Um, they're distinct. One can't be mapped onto the other by any, any transformation. So there's a swallowtail, elliptic, umbilic, and hyperbolic umbilic. And the, and the higher ones contain the lower ones. So if you look on the swallowtail, where you've got cusps up the top here. So you have these, these singular sheets and lines and, and ultimately points. And so this is the, the mathematical description. Um, so each of these things, for, for every dimension of of space, these are the allowed ones, um, and they're generated by a, a generating function. So I don't know, some things in life are, are so beautiful they make you want to cry, and in, in my case, it's one of these. I don't know if anyone, Andrea, are you crying? No, I don't see you in tears. Uh, this is remarkable. I mean, what they're saying is, what, so this is the theory uh, due to René Tom originally, a French uh, mathematician, and, and Arnold, a Russian mathematician. Uh, is that the, the structurally stable singularities of these, of these gradient maps can be described by these generating functions. And you can think of these as actions 
Okay, they are uh, they're linear in the control parameters. Those are those are the space, the parameters of space, like x, y, and z, and so on. Uh, and then the they're nonlinear. They're, they're polynomials in in the state variable s, and that's something that sort of labels the classical path, if you like. I'll show you some examples. Well, there's an example here. There's these different uh, state variables. Um, Okay, so, so for example, yeah, this is for the cusp, this is how it works. So the cusp, you have this, uh, this quartic action, and so we know, well, we know how to get classical mechanics. Okay, by Fermat's principle, we look for the stationary, the, the stationary path where the action is stationary, so, so we take the first derivative with respect to S, and we get a cubic, and then to get a caustic, it's one more. It's stationary to one higher order. We take another derivative, and we get this equation, and then between these two equations, uh, we can eliminate S, and we're left purely with an equation for C1 and C2, and actually this is the equation for a cusp. But uh, I said, uh, you know, that at, at, a, at a caustic, that the, the geometric theory, the classical theory, breaks down, and you need to go one step further. Well, how do you do that? Well, you just basically do a path integral. If we know the action, we can come up with a path integral. And if we, in the case of the... Uh, of the, of the cusp, we have, so we have this quartic action again, and, we, and so to get the path integral, what we're doing is we're summing over all the, 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 the label of the paths, and S is, labels all the paths. We get this function, it's a function now of these spatial coordinates C1 and C2, uh, C1 goes across and C2 uh, goes up. Um, this is a complex number in general, so it has an amplitude and a phase. Actually, if you look at the phase, these are vortex-anti-vortex -vortex pairs, they're dislocations, in other words, that proliferate as you, as you go up in time. There's also a line of, of vortices up either side. Uh, so this is a, a special function, in fact. It's not, many people might not, you know, realize that. Uh, but if you look in this, in the new edition of what I would call Abramovitz and Stegun, the new, the new NIST, the handbook of mathematical functions, you can find it in, in the last chapter. They're called diffraction integrals there, a chapter by Michael Berry. Uh, if you look at the, what happens at the cusp then to this action, so as you change C1 and C2, as you change these two parameters, uh, you, uh, you change the, the form of this function. So it goes from being this, this double well thing with three classical solutions in the middle. When you go across one of these, these are called fold lines and they meet at a cusp point, Two of the solutions annihilate, and you just have one solution outside on either side, and all three of them annihilate at once. So this is the most, this is the brightest part of the caustic, the most, the most singular part. Okay. So applying this to, um, to the Hamiltonian mean field then. So we've, we've kind of heard, let me remind you though, that you can think of the, the Hamiltonian mean field model as being uh, particles on a ring interacting with this, with this cosine uh, potential, which just depends on the difference in their, in their two angles. And in, in that sense, it's not really a mean field theory in, in my book. Okay, then this is, you know, can be perfectly exact. Whereas if you think of it as the XY model, um, then normally you would think of these, these rotors you know, spread out over a long, uh, you know, in, in space. Um, then it becomes mean field when you have long-range interactions and they all see each other identically. Then you get this sum. It doesn't die off in any way. So you can imagine all those rotors then sitting on top of each other, on, you know, on, so sitting on top of each other on this, on this circle here. So how can we, how can we realize this with, with cold atoms? Okay, so there, there was an experiment uh, in 2012 by Tillman Esslinger's group in Zurich and he realized uh, these laser-induced interactions between um, atoms. So the idea is you have this, this cloud of atoms, a B, C, actually, uh, in a cavity. And you, you illuminate it from the side, not through the end mirrors, but from the side. And then what happens is a photon comes in, uh, and it can then get scattered to one of the neighboring atoms before it then rejoins the, the laser beam. And so after it's, after it's exited... Uh, your atoms are both back in their, in their ground state, and you're left with, if you integrate out the photons, um, a long-range uh, potential. But it's not quite what we want. So if you look up here, um, so there's, there's was in two dimensions, 
We'll only need this in one dimension, so you can confine the atoms so that they're kind of in a waveguide, if you like. Um, so if you look at, say, uh, imagine that the long axis of the, of the cavities is the z direction, then you have z and, and z prime, so it's, it's a product of two cosines, uh, but that's not cosine of z minus z prime, of course. So one way to get that is rather than to consider a, uh, a Fabry-Perot cavity with, with this fixed where the, the boundary conditions really fix your, your mode, your mode structure, uh, you consider a ring cavity, okay? And in a ring cavity, the modes are running waves, and you're much closer to the free space situation. So uh, this, is the free, this is the real part of the potential, the, the, dip, the laser-induced dipole-dipole interaction. You have, a, you have two atoms. This is this supposed to represent a sort of cloud of atoms. But you have two atoms some, somewhere in here, and you, sh you illuminate it with a laser. Uh, here, R is the distance between, the, the two, between two particles. You get this, uh, this, this long-range interaction. You see the one, if you, the R cubed here is going to cancel with this R squared. You get a 1 upon R term, in fact, outside there. Uh, but when you put it in a cavity, it doesn't die away at all. You get this, so the cavity gives you this infinite range because you're interacting purely through this cavity mode that, it, that extends... Uh, Forever, but you do then get this because uh, it's a ring cavity. What turns out is you, you get the difference between the two positions. So, uh, in that way, I believe you can realize that's one way to realize the Hamiltonian mean field model kind of rather directly. Uh, if you, uh, okay, so, so then imagine we can put a condensate, and um, the experimentalists can do amazing things. They, they have made um, condensates in, in, inside these optical cavities. So, so then the, the equation that describes a, a Bose-Einstein condensate uh, is called the Gross-Potevsky equation. So this is the equation for the condensate wave function. So it's a mean field equation, actually, okay? because we've reduced a many-body problem to a function of a single position. You know, this, if this was the full many-body wave function, it would be positions of all the particles. But in the mean field theory, it's just a function of, of one position. Um, and then we add in, so this is basically a Schrodinger equation, but now we add in this nonlinear term, which is just the mean field potential at any particular angle is due to that propagated to it from all the, by, by cos, to, from all the other, the other points. Um, now something, uh, so th th this system has been worked on by Chavani and, uh, and looks at various instabilities and so on. One, one thing that actually my student Ryan proved is that this potential is always... A, a cosine potential, okay? But it has, a, in general, a time-varying amplitude, which one has to work out, and also its position around the ring can move with time. But it still always has the form of a cosine potential, which is kind of neat, and that means you can solve this problem using Mathieu equations, because then this, is, this, is the, this, this equation becomes the Mathieu equation. You can solve it with Mathieu functions. So what do you get? Um, so on, on the left is, uh, is a sort of brute force numerical solution of the Gross-Potevsky equation from a particular initial state. So we had to really whack it. I mean, this isn't a perturbation, really. And this, so this would be uniform around the ring. And then we've really put in a, a large density modulation around the ring. Um, and the reason we had to put a large density modulation is that the thing damps, that this, the, that the potential damps away very quickly. Uh, I suspect that this is due to Landau damping, but that's something we're still looking at. But lo and behold, what, what do you get? So this isn't at all, you know, this isn't, this, this is for this sort of condensate wave function. Nevertheless, catastrophe theory would tell you, well, if you're going to get any singularities in this system, they're going to have to be cusps, and it's a wavy system. It's, it's a quantum wave in this case. So you're going to get Piercy functions. And indeed, that's what you see, and they carry on going, although they do begin to die out. If you put, uh, if you solve, you go back and you say, oh, what was the mean field potential at each moment in time? And then you solve for the trajectories in, for a sort of point particle trajectory in that, this is what you get. And in indeed, you see these classical uh, trajectories. And what's lying behind all of this is, of course, this cosine potential. So if this was a perfectly harmonic potential and was static, 
you, know, you would focus all of these, you know, the property of a harmonic potential, just like a lens, is its isochronous. And all the trajectories, no matter how large their amplitude, would fo focus perfectly to focus points. But we don't get that. We get these, these caustics here because of the nonlinearity of this potential. And, uh, and you, get these, you, know, you, so you get these repeating caustics. Um, another example uh, where you can uh, get these where I found these caustics is in this, in the Ising model, you look at now for long range interactions. So you have, so every, every spin is, is interacting with every other. Um, and, but if we, so if, if we're in this, in the, with, with these long range interactions, we can replace uh, these, we can re replace the spin operators the, the, for the individual particles by a total spin operator, total spin Z and total spin X. And then our Hamiltonian takes this form. And this is a famous uh, Hamiltonian that came up in nuclear physics in the 1960s, lipkin meshkov glick uh, model. And so what you have is this kind of giant spin, this macroscopic spin. It's still a quantum object, well, depending on how long, how long you make it. But if it's not too long, it's gonna, still going to be, in principle, a quantum object. Um, if you look at the, uh, at the classical limit of it, so you associate, say, the spin, the z direction, with uh, this variable n here, uh, and, uh, and then uh, sx, uh, you know, is, uh, that's the component along the x direction, looks like this. Then you get a, uh, an equation that looks like the, the equation for a pendulum. But it's a pendulum whose length depends on, if we treat n as its angular momentum, on, on the angular momentum. So its, it's length changes. Uh, and this is a, a studied system. Uh, and in particular, you get, you get various types of dynamics. You can think of this giant spin li living on the surface of, of a sort of block sphere, a many particle block sphere. And you get, you get two types where you, you get ellipses below a, certain, uh, below a certain excitation energy, but then you can also get uh, more interesting uh, hyperbolic uh, fixed points and things like that. Um, in particular, uh, you can realize this model with basically a, a bosonic Josephson junction. Uh, some of the original theory was done by Augusto Smertzi. And uh, there have been experiments by uh, Marcus Obertaler's uh, group. And um, Gershon here. And Steinhauer, Jeff Steinhauer at the Technion. Um, and uh, so the idea is you have two condensates in a, in a double well trap, and then n represents the number difference between the two, uh, the difference in the number of atoms, and phi represents the phase difference between the two sides. Um, and so you can realize this Hamiltonian or a quantum version of it in, even. Another example would be um, two rotational states of a BC on a ring or superfluid on a ring. Uh, you also get a, a sort of pendulum uh, Hamiltonian in that situation. So if you solve, again, so this time I've got rid of this square root 1 minus n squared. That, that can be important, but to see for you, for certain, if, if your uh, number difference is rather small, you can set that equal to 1. So you just look at the low energy excitations, then you really just have the pendulum equation. And so again, we have this cosine potential. Uh, and if you look at, say, so each of these lines is a solution of the Josephson equation, or in other words, the Gross-Bitevsky equation. You can either look for the phase as a function of time or the number as a function of time. Now this is for a particular, so I've drawn a bunch of trajectories here to get these, these caustic curves. So this is the problem, uh, uh, a well-known problem in, um, in condensed matter. What happens if you put two superfluids that have never seen each other before, you put them together? Okay, well, if you, they initially start uh, separate, they have a well-defined number difference, but due to quantum mechanics, number difference and phase difference are conjugate variables there. So you have no idea of the phase. So before they, they're put in contact, they have no phase relationship between them, and they have to build it up. And so this is the initial condition we take here, that you start off in a well-defined number difference state. I've taken it to be zero. I don't have to because, uh, because of the structural stability of caustics, in fact. Um, but uh, this is the correct, this is the closest, the classical, the mean field theory, because each of these is a solution of these mean field equations, can get to the quantum is by superimposing all these different trajectories, say, with all possible initial phases. And again, you see we get these, these caustics. If you look at the, at the quantum version, well, then 
the number difference between the two condensates, you know, atoms can't be smoothly, can't be smoothly, uh, they, they come in little packets of one, and so you, the, this, this, this number difference, which is actually a Fox space coordinate, is quantized, it's, it's normalized here, to one, but uh, uh, so then you, you find that, this, this, that you get this discretized pattern. And what's interesting about this is, so if you do the, the mean field theory with all these trajectories and you sum up all these trajectories, you get the caustics, which is a bit like the classical theory, and, and they are singular here. So the, this is the probability density. If you did a measurement at some time, this is 3.3 pi, it's right over here. Uh, this is the probability density. You would find this number difference. You, know, you redo the experiment many, many times to build up this, this pattern. Uh, but it, it's singular. So what you have to do in this theory to get non to, to remove the singularity, to make things well behaved, is to actually quantize it, second quantize it. And that is what regularizes these singularities, these mean field singularities. And so this is an example of a quantum catastrophe. At each, each, at each place where a theory fails, you have to go up to the next, uh, next theory. So if you didn't know that atoms existed, you believed all fluids were just you know, like water, continuum fluids, you would have discovered atoms, I suppose, here. Uh, OK. So in summary, uh, uh, I hope I've convinced you, or at least piqued your interest, that these catastrophe things are, are, are generic objects in dynamics. Uh, there's at least three levels of, of structure. There's geometric, classical, classical wave quantum. You can also get polarization, singularity. I didn't discuss that. Um, if, so we've looked at the very simple case of just two-mode fields, basically. Then, uh, then you, you, the cusp is the singularity you're going to get there. I didn't emphasize it, but the cusp has a lot of, because it's, this, it's a well-studied mathematical function, it has lots of scaling properties and things like that. Um, so you, once you know you have one of these, these catastrophes, you know a lot. You know a lot about your many-body wave function around that region. Um, they're regularized by various different things, either by going to a wave theory or by going to a quantum field theory where you need really discrete excitations. And, and so the role of the long-range interactions in all of this was to provide this, this, this overall long-range potential, this, this collective potential, this focusing potential that generated this, these structures. And so an obvious question is, well, okay, this is a two-mode quantum field. Uh, what do we do, let's say, you can, uh, yeah, if you want to go to a, a multi-mode uh, field, then these things, okay, so the catastrophes are known in higher and higher dimensions, but they get increasingly complex, and there's too much information, at least for me. And so then I think you'd want to go over into a statistical theory, which, which does exist, actually, for catastrophes, where you look at how moments diverge and so on. Okay, thank you very much for your attention.